and as the man began to lay the strokes upon my back, I said to the people, Though my flesh should fail, and my spirit should fail, yet God would not fail. These are the words of Obadiah Holmes. Who did he write them to? What was his crime? And what can we learn from it? Obadiah Holmes was a Baptist. He wrote that in the 1650s after he was imprisoned for several months. And what do you suppose his crime was? What was his great criminal action? Was it violence against another man? Was it slandering another man's good name? Was it counterfeiting? Maybe he raped somebody. What did he do? What was his crime? He was grievously tormented, whipped, well whipped. And he spent from July till September in prison. What did he do? He went into Massachusetts and he held a Baptist meeting there. Actually, he didn't even hold the meeting. His pastor did. So here's the story. Here's what happened to Obadiah Holmes. John Clark and Obadiah Holmes are members of a church in Rhode Island. One of their members, William Witter, is in Massachusetts, just a couple miles away from them, but within the bounds of Massachusetts. William Witter asks them to come and visit him for some comfort and consolation. Holmes, Clark, and they take another man, John Crandall, go into Massachusetts to gain the greeting of William Witter. They arrive on Saturday, and as they're going to be there on Sunday, decide that they're going to have a meeting, wherein Mr. Clark is going to preach to them. And so they are gathered together, and right after John Clark gets done praying and he begins to open the scriptures to them, immediately the authorities come in and stop the meeting and put a halt to it and say, you and you and you are coming with us. And so the Baptists, excuse me, the Baptists make a plea to the authorities and say, well, can we, can we finish what we're doing before we go with you? No, come with me right now. And what had happened is a warrant had been issued for the arrest of Mr. Clark, John Clark, Obadiah Holmes, and John Crandall. So they're taken to the authorities, and while they're there, while they're then put in prison, they're then brought before uh, the bar, so to speak, the magistrate, and told, uh, reprimanded, so to speak, for their Baptist position. Because you have to understand, then, it's illegal to hold a Baptist meeting within the bounds of Massachusetts. It's against the law to hold this unauthorized meeting. So in all the infinite wisdom of the Puritans in Massachusetts, willing to come to America to gain their freedom from the established religion in England, they come over here with their perverted sense of liberty and say, liberty for us. Who is it? Winthrop and Cotton Mather and those gentlemen. They come over to America and they say, liberty for us and law for all of you. Law for all of you. And this, was not, this wasn't the case in Rhode Island at the time. Remember, the time of these events is 1651. It's illegal to be a Baptist within the bounds of Massachusetts to practice your religion, and to worship God according to your conscience. You have to worship according to the conscience of another man, namely the authorities of Massachusetts. And so, before the authorities in Massachusetts, they say something to the effect of, you can never maintain these false doctrines before our eminent ministers. And John Clark's like, bring it on. Let's go. Set the day. I'll be there. We'll talk. And they're like, okay, we'll do it. And as you can imagine, they never do it. 
And all three men are sentenced to have a certain fine levied against them. And all three of them refuse to pay the fine. They all refuse to pay. Why? Because if this is some of, at least they're thinking, uh, if I agree to pay the fine, then I agree that what I did was wrong and worthy of some sort of financial remuneration to the state. That if I admit or that my paying the fine, so to speak, is an admittance of the rightness of the law to which I uh, now am held accountable for breaking. And they refuse to do it. They refuse to pay the fine. And so a day is set for them to be well whipped. Well, the day comes and John Crandall and John Clark's fines have been paid. But one man's fine was not paid, and that is Obadiah Holmes. You have to understand at this point now, the pastor of the church in Rhode Island was John Clark. Interestingly enough, Holmes becomes the second pastor of that church. And Holmes had had a run-in previously with the people in Massachusetts, which is probably why his fine was like 30% more than, let's say, or 50% more, somewhere around there, than Clark's fine. His was uh, way more. So instead, he is sentenced to be well whipped, 30 strokes uh, upon his back. And what now? Why? What happened? He went to someone's house and tried to worship God. Did he harm any other man's good name? Did he try to take away from any other? Did he try and impose his own conscience regarding the right worship of God upon another by force? No. But that was being done to him. Moreover, in Rhode Island, where Clark Holmes and Crandall were from, religious liberty was granted to all, or full liberty in religious concernments was granted to all within Rhode Island. And you can thank John Clark and Roger Williams for that. John Clark's actually the one who was in England and got the charter for Rhode Island from the king. So if you, Roger Williams was obviously instrumental in this, but I don't ever hear anyone talk about <clears throat> John Clark when they talk about the founding of Rhode Island. And he's the one who got the charter from the king. Anyway, so the day comes and... Uh, well, let me read the story to you. And then, after I tell you, uh, after I give you what happened in Holmes' words, I'll give you the full, uh, basically the full letter, you'll be surprised to find out who this letter is from. So, st if you stay to the end of me reading this letter, it's like, a, it's like one moderate page long. It's not going to be super long, maybe a minute or two. But you, I think you're going to be very surprised to find out who... This was written to, and then we're going to talk about some lessons, some other lessons from it. So bear with me as I turn to page 37 in this. <clears throat> the book that I'm going to read this particular account from is The History of the Baptist in New England by Burridge. This portion is actually going to be a portion that's recorded in The History of the Baptist in New England by Isaac Bacchus, for those who are nerdy and want to know that kind of stuff. Okay. Here's what... Uh, is recorded concerning Holmes and then Holmes' own words. It says this, he was kept in prison until September and then brought, before, brought forth for punishment. Having been stripped of his clothing, Holmes was delivered to the executioner who was told to do his office. Mr. Holmes tells the story of what followed. So this is Holmes' own words in a letter to who? Just wait and you'll see. It's very exciting. Here's what happened in Holmes' own words. As the man began to lay the strokes upon my back, I said to the people, though my flesh should fail and my spirit should fail, yet God would not fail. So it pleased the Lord to come in and fill my heart and tongue as a vessel full. And with an audible voice, I broke forth, praying unto the Lord not to lay the sin to their charge and telling the people that now I found he did not fail me. And therefore, now I should trust him forever who failed me not. 
For in truth, as the strokes fell upon me, I had such a spiritual manifestation of God's presence as the like thereunto I never heard, nor felt, nor can with fleshly tongue express. And the outward pain was so removed from me that indeed I am not able to declare it to you. It was so easy to me that I could well bear it, yea, in a manner felt it not, although it was grievous, as the spectators say. The man striking with all his strength, yea, spitting on his hands three times, as many affirm, with a three-corded whip giving me therewith thirty strokes. When he had loosed me from the post, having joyfulness in my heart, and cheerfulness in my countenance, as the spectators observed. I told the magistrates, you have struck me as with roses. And said, moreover, although the Lord hath made it easy to me, yet I pray God it may not be laid to your charge. Interestingly enough, as a result of the trial of Obadiah Holmes, the first president of Harvard, okay, as a result of the trial and punishment of Obadiah Holmes, the first president of Harvard repudiates the doctrine of infant baptism because he's spurned by seeing the testimony of Holmes, Clark, and Crandall to study the matter. And he turns away from pedo-baptism, becomes a convinced Baptist, and you know what happens to him? He gets fired. Henry Dunster was his name. So... Who was this letter written to? Well, it was lit written to a group of Baptists in London. You might recognize their names as uh, they are given here in the History of the Baptists in New England by Isaac Bacchus. Here's the, the Holmes's letter, by the way, is long and contained in... Uh, the History of the Baptists in New England by Isaac Bacchus. So if you want the full-length version of Holmes' own testimony concerning that experience, I would commend it to you, and it's in this. But it also here contains the end of the letter, and it says, Unto the well-beloved John Spilsbury, William Kiffin, and the rest that in London stand fast in the faith. Now, why is that significant? Why is it significant that Holmes writes the letter to Spilsbury and Kiffin in London? They received the letter in 1652. What happened in 1644 and 1646 and so on? The first London Baptist Confession of Faith was drafted by those several congregations in London. And whose names are on it? You don't find... Uh, some names until later. But whose names do you find as fixed to that document? You'll find John Spilsbury's name. You'll find William Kiffin's name. So now we've got Obadiah Holmes, who's in America, linked with those Baptists in London who stand fast in the faith. And why is that especially significant to me, let's say? Well, Kiffin not only signed the first London Baptist Confession of Faith, he signed the second London Baptist Confe Confession of Faith as well. And he wasn't the only one to do that. Hanser Knowles or Nollies or HK uh, also signed the first and second London Baptist Confession of Faith. So it has a direct historical in, uh, connection, I guess, to those who confess the second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Obadiah Holmes has a connection to all who can, because his connection is the common confession that we would ultimately uh, subscribe to, or he's linked to it, I should say. Why is that significant? Well, here's a few reasons why it's significant. Number one, when you study Baptist history, don't just read the stories of the amazing accomplishments of these men, but I really like let's say, making this link between Holmes, Spilsbury, Kiffin, the first London, the second London, uh, maybe with uh, the church in Wapping and uh, the different things that happened there. 
Uh, but when we study Baptist history, you should study what these men believed. What did they believe? Because you want to study them, but why are you studying them? Well, because they're Baptists. Okay, what did that mean? What did it mean for Obadiah Holmes to be a Baptist? Well, it meant, uh, first of all, standing by his convictions. So here's some other things that we can learn from it. So first thing, when we study Baptist history, study what they believed as well as studying what they did. Uh, The second thing that we can learn from this is the absolute tyranny that is established when you're willing to grant liberty, liberty to yourself, that is religious liberty, and a crushing law to all others who are not willing to comply with your definition of what it means to have a good conscience before God. Do you understand that is what was happening in Massachusetts? Those, the governors of Massachusetts, established what it meant to have a good conscience toward God. And what that meant was that you bring your children, you bring your children to us, and we will baptize them, and you will be a part of our church. And if you're not, you will be punished, excommunicated, or kicked out. And if you come back, we'll whip you nearly to your death, to where you have to sleep on your knees for several weeks because you can't roll over on your back, till the blood runs and fills your shoes. That's what they did to Holmes, okay? It's very graphic, and as I said, the full story is recorded in the history of the Baptists in New England by Isaac Bacchus. You can also find it in America in Crimson Red by James Beller. If you really want it, you can find it there. America in Crimson Red by James Beller. Okay, you should go get that. So, uh, first thing, know what they believe. Second thing that we're on right now is the importance then of religious liberty, of allowing others the liberty to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience if it does no harm to other other men's estates, names, or their prosperity. If it matters nothing to someone else, then leave them, leave them be, okay? Leave them be in matters of what it means to have a good conscience toward God. The second thing, that's the second thing. The third thing then is uh, understand then if this is the case in Massachusetts that Clark Holmes and Crandall went into Massachusetts, they knew it was illegal and they did it. What does that tell you about what Baptists believe about Romans chapter number 13? That we are willing to disobey the civil magistrate when the dictates of conscience and the worship of God require us to do so, we will do so. We don't just go out and cause domestic turbulence for no good reason. But Clark Holmes and Crandalls went to gain William Witter's greeting and they were punished for it knowing that it was illegal. It's not like they got there and was like, oh, we can't have this meeting here. Didn't know that. They did know that. As I said, Holmes had already had a run-in with the people in Massachusetts prior to this. So understand that the Baptists have always been willing to disobey the civil magistrate when it's required of them to do so. So they're willing to disobey. Baptists are. They're also willing to grant religious liberty that is full uh, liberty in religious concernments. It's on the Capitol building in Rhode Island. It's great. It says that a most flourishing civil state may exist with full liberty in religious concernments. And you know who wrote that? Third thing that you need to understand, Baptists then paid a price for their principles. Obadiah Holmes was willing to suffer and to suffer gladly, to suffer joyfully, and to uh, leave an example for us to follow. Can you imagine, like, What an example for us looking back to see the price that he paid. And there's a long, long, long line of godly men who have shed their blood and laid it down in the service of the truth. And we have this and we're able to look back and learn about it. So perhaps I would admonish you to learn history, but don't just learn history generally. This, what I've given you today, or like let's say these three books and I've mentioned others, Uh, This is the story of the English Baptists. This is where the list of, this is 
History of the English Baptist by J.C. Carlyle, C-A-R-L-I-L-E. And this is what has the names of the, you're not going to be able to see it, but the names of the signers of the First London Baptist Confession of Faith. And as we went over the history of the Baptist by Burridge, this is called the Baptist Library. That well, There's a whole story with how I was able to get that. Uh, the internet stopped working when I tried to buy it. That was a nightmare. That was sad. I can't go into it. Okay, I lost. I lost an eBay auction trying to buy that set. And it took me years to get it, another one of it. Okay, <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> study Baptist history. See the price that Baptists paid uh, in order to gain religious liberty, understand that you often hear it said, well, nine of the original 13 colonies were had church-state marriages. And you hear that quoted by people like it's a good thing. It's not a good thing. This is why it's not a good thing. This is why religious liberty was pushed in Virginia is because the Baptists continually petitioned for separation of the church and the state in the sense that the state shouldn't be meddling with the churches and telling them what it means to have a good conscience toward God regarding the worship of God. No, no. The state doesn't get to define what a good conscience toward God is because this is what happens. Because who's this? Here's the, here's the problem with it. In one generation, you have the Presbyterians who are in charge of the state. They define what a good conscience toward God is, and so they punish all the Baptists, let's say, for not baptizing their children and being part of the state church and being in the covenant. Uh, and then the next generation, maybe the Universalists get in, and the next generation, maybe it's the Arminians, and you constantly have this flow of blood from people who, who can't figure it out that it's not the purview or the jurisdiction of the state to establish what it means to have a good conscience toward God in regards to religious worship. So, <clears throat> when you hear it quoted that nine of the original 13 colonies had church, state, marriage, official established churches, yeah, that's not good. That's not, that's not a good statistic to quote. And this uh, stream of blood that you see flowing in the American colonies is testimony to that. The uh, rivers of blood flowing in England our testimony that it's not good to have a church-state marriage. It's not good. And so the Baptists fought for religious liberty, and I hope you hold religious liberty to be very dear. As Obadiah, Obadiah Holmes <clears throat> was absolutely whipped in Boston just for holding a Baptist meeting. And a hundred years later, in the exact same place, is where the Boston Massacre took place, in the exact same place. And you could say the bloodshed in both cases was for the same purpose, and that is liberty. I wish you well.